Hello and happy Sabbath. Okay. Today in Ephesians 1, 15 through 17. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you and remembering you in my prayers. I have not... That I already read. I keep asking that God of our... Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. <laughs> that was energetic. That was wonderful. And I hope that you believe it. Are you believing that God has given you the spirit of wisdom and knowledge today because in these chaotic times that we find ourselves, uh, we need to know how we're going to get through. One of the things that I did recently while I was away for a few days in Georgia uh, was to watch uh, a documentary called Amazing Grace. It's a movie that's come out recently about Aretha Franklin. And one of the great songs that she sings is I just got over, I just got over. And you know that there's lots of history about persecuted peoples in the world, but I can tell you that each one of us probably has a story about when we were persecuted. When something was happening to us that we just had to get over. Right now this congregation is in mourning. We're praying to our God to give us the strength not to get over but to get through because it's going to be a while it's going to be a while and it should be but I enjoyed that song and I chose texts today to look at that I think about at least when I am wanting to know the answer that is in Psalm 121. If you turn in your Bibles to that, we'll look at it one more time. It asks the question, and I'm glad for how Patrick read it, because many other people, I'm just going to say it, they read it wrong. So Patrick, 10 points, you read it right. I lift up my eyes to the hills. In my version, it has a dash. Do you have a dash? Do you have a comma? Do you have a pause? Because many people want to read the next phrase and believe that it should just be run on, when in actual fact we should pause after that first phrase. I look to the hills I lift up my eyes to the hills. Then comes the question, where does my help come from? Because you see, David is believing not in the religion of the hills. And I want to affirm the fact that this day that we sit here in this place at this time on this Sabbath day because we are not participating in the religion of the hills. You see, because on the top of the hills was where the Canaanites had their religion, where they celebrated to the sun god and the moon god, or the moon goddess. Read on with me and you'll see that David includes the fact that he will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. And here it comes. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. And you're thinking, yes, I know about sunburn, but I haven't heard about moonburn. David's not talking about sunburn. David's not talking about moonlight. He is talking about the worship 
of the created instead of the creator. So back to the first question. I lift up my eyes to the hills. Is this where, is this where I get my help from in time of trouble, in time of chaos? No, no. My help, he says, my help comes from the Lord who will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and your going both now and forevermore. I don't know about you, but this is, this is what brings me hope. This is what brings me to faith. And this is what brings me peace in moments like this. And I just want to say that the pain and the sort of the dull throbbing in my soul can only be helped in times like this by knowing a God like this. So then I couldn't help. As I was thinking about what to say today, I, I turned in my Bible to, to Ephesians, this letter that Paul writes to his church, which he started and helped to nurture in Ephesus. And I thought to myself, you know, here it is. Here is what we need to hear again today, of all days. Here is what we need to hear after we have been through not one, but what do, what do we call them now? A pre-earthquake? What is it? Foreshock. Foreshock and then shock. <laughs> Life and death. What do we need to hear at this, at this moment? We need to hear from the Apostle Paul when he says in verse 9, He, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 9, He made known to us the mystery. So if you're, if you're at all worried about the chaos that is going on in the world today, if you want to know what God has in store he has made known the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when times will have reached their fulfillment to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. My friends, it's tough these days to make head or tails of what is going on, both personally, both within our families, and then also within our country and the whole world, because we're so connected these days. We're, we're, we're not at all separated because, of course, we all, we all carry these, these devices, right? Okay? How many of you, ra raise your hand if you have WhatsApp. Come on, tell it like it is, okay. Well, the rest of you obviously don't have anybody in the Philippines that you want to talk to for free. Okay. I have a very small list of people that I use WhatsApp with, but while Edgar and Nelly have been away, I've been getting WhatsApp from them while they're down in Puerto Vallarta. Or if I want to talk to my friend in Lebanon... I can talk to him for free, or I can even video chat with him. Come on now, you need WhatsApp. <laughs> yeah, I'm not, I'm not selling anything. It, it's, I'm actually selling the fact that we are connected. You, you, you can't get away from the fact that we're connected. And in fact, somebody's calling me right now. I should have put it on. <laughs> yeah, it's my brother. Shall I, shall I tell him that I'm preaching? <laughs> yeah, he did that on purpose, probably because he's watching. Because this is another way that we're connected. My family that I was with this last weekend, they watch from Canada. They watch from, from the eastern United States. We're connected in this chaos that we find ourselves. I don't know. We, we all can ask ourselves, where, where were you when the real earthquake happened? The, the 7.0 or 7.1 I was coming into my neighborhood and I thought that something was going wrong with my car. <laughs> I, 
I'm just going to say this. Again, through the times of being with Ginger and Pete, and the more we know, the more we don't know. So it's good to hear from the Apostle this morning that he will reveal to us, has revealed to us, the mystery of the plan of salvation. Ellen White tells us that we will be looking into this plan forever. And it suddenly struck me, we're going to have an eternal aha. Okay, so that's why it happened this way. There's going to be so many times when we are going to say to ourselves, okay, I didn't know why things were going that way then, but now I know why they happened. If there's ever, for me at least, I'm, I'm an inquisitive person, if there's ever a reason why I want to get to heaven, want to get to the other side, want to get over as Aretha sings, is so that I can find out why. And I've got a God who reveals mysteries to people and he has promised that he will tell us, he will show us why. We'll be saying, aha, forever, as we figure it all out. He's made known the mystery already according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ, Verse 10, to bring all things in heaven and earth under one head, that is, in Christ. In him, we were also chosen. And, and, and here comes a big word. Are you ready? Predestined. We were chosen and we were predestined to be part of God's family. It is known as his unnatural act, but the unnatural act of God will be to give people what they want, and those people will be the ones who don't want to be with him. That's a very unnatural thing, because you see, the natural inclination for our God, the good news to you today, is that he wants all of his family back together with him. That's what he wants. That is his natural inclination. We were talking in Sabbath school about love. God is love. He can do no other. He is wanting to love us back to himself. There will be millions, unfortunately, who basically say, I, I don't know if, if I want to live in your family. And God will say, okay, if that's what you want. And he will give them the desires of their heart. That's, that's how I read Revelation 22. When he comes back and he says that his reward is with him. Each according to what they have done. Which as you know, shows what you think because you do the stuff that you think about. So if you really, really want to live with God forever and ever, and you want to find out what it is to get over to the other side, what that life is going to be like in the presence of God, if you really want that, if that is the greatest desire of your heart, then he is going to give you that desire. He is going to give you that desire. So that we were the first, Paul says in verse 12, so that we were the first to hope in Christ. We were predestined. We were born to be brought into the family of God. God wants us back even though we have 
uh, preferences that come from our DNA that keep us not wanting to, to follow God and that make it difficult for us to accept his leadership in our lives. Even though that is the case, God has sent his son into the world to help us to know him and to want him. We're predestined. And Paul says, this is what gives me hope. Three words today that I would bring to you for your uh, thinking. They are the three words here in Ephesians chapter 1 and 2 that just jump off the page. And so in good fashion, I have taken out my colored pencils, which I encourage you to do. Thank you, LaVon, for making them available every week. And underline these words. The word is hope. In order that we who were the first to hope in Christ, this is verse 12, might be for the praise of his glory. My friends, Barry's story this morning helps me to help you to understand that from the very moment that he created humankind, he created them for his glory. So it's very simple. The difference between those who accept God and those who don't really has to do with the fact that there are those who want the glory for themselves. They're not willing to give the glory of whoever they are or whatever they have done. They're not willing to give that to God. They are only wanting it for themselves. I did it. How does he sing it? My way. See why I have said before, and I'll say again, this is the national anthem of the humanistic trend in our world today that I believe is the biggest religion on the face of the planet. Doing it my way, I get the glory. It's, it's so astounding to me that God has given us scripture in which there are story after story after story of the way that God chooses the weakest and the most unlikely. And from a leadership perspective, you think, why is God doing this? Well, this is the reason. It's because when David kills Goliath as the youngest son who was given the dirty job of taking care of the sheep, he is the most unlikely to be chosen for this huge job. And that when he succeeds, people know it's not David. It's the Lord. And the Lord is with David. Now Saul, Saul had to spend the rest, rest of his life wrestling with this concept and we know that at the end of Saul's life he still had not given in to God he did it his own way and even when he went to the witch of Endor and asked to see the ghost of Samuel Samuel comes up and says you're going to die tomorrow so you could say that he got his fondest wish which was to not be associated with the God of life Verse 18, I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which you are called. The riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. There is a lovely picture that hangs, I believe, in the white estate and it's not the one that is almost as long as this wall here where you have people going on an upward trail that gets narrower and narrower and narrower. No, that's not the one that I like the best. I, I like the one where in the background there is a picture of the world and coming out of that world is, is it looks like the swirl of a, of a tornado but it's actually a line of people and as you get closer and closer to the foreground of the picture, you see Jesus in the lead, and behind him are all the people who are coming with him who, who he has rescued from earth. 
and they're on their way to the heavenly city. That's, that's the picture, that's the picture that I love. Because you see, in, in Roman times, when, when the Romans would capture a particular land, they would bring back the spoils, and they would have this huge parade that would go down Main Street in Rome, and they would show off all the things that they had just brought back from this land that they had conquered. They call it a train. This is the picture, in some respects, that the Apostle Paul is wanting us to have in our mind that we, we are the glory of Christ. Because he is, he is the one who has come to save us, and he is going to march into Zion with his train behind him. I don't know about you, but I want to be part of that train. I want to be part of that train that makes its way through the streets of gold as we look up and we see angels who have worked with us and protected us and kept us until that day. Want to meet your angel? I'd like to. And in his incomparable great power, this is, this is verse 19, not only do we have hope, but we have hope in a God who has power beyond our imagination and probably beyond our imagination once we make heaven. We will not be able to ever fathom how much power God has. Just to know that he has the power to save us is amazing. To know that he has the power that he raised Christ from the dead and that as Paul says, he has placed him at the right hand and that he has made him ruler above all and that he is the head of the church. Let's review our Greek quickly, shall we? And that uh, as you look back at the exit signs, one of which is lit, and we probably need two new bulbs in the back ones, but the, the word exit is also part of the word ekklesia or ek. It means the ones who have been called out. That's why the two words are similar. That is what ecclesia or ecclesia means. Christ is the head of the group of people who have said, in this world today, in this chaotic situation we find ourselves today, we will not pay attention to the ruler of the air in this world. Because we have another shepherd. We have another ruler who leads and guides us and to whom we give our allegiance. Yes, I read that declaration again on the 4th. And yes, I'm proud to be an American. And yes, I was in agreement with a good friend of mine who wrote on Facebook, don't, don't be downing America because we haven't yet reached the ideals for which we stand? We're a work in progress. We still believe in those ideals. At least I do. And I still believe this is the greatest nation on earth because of those ideals. God is the same way. He is saying, come be part of my kingdom. Come Come, let me lead you and guide you. Be sheep of my pasture, and I will lead you. I will lead you home. First Peter, verse, chapter three, verse nine says that if you do not want to perish, if you do not want to be part of those who will be blotted out of existence, you have to decide. You have to repent. It's an interesting word from the Old English, but it certainly is apropos today in this discussion. We need to decide whose country we're going to live in. Who will have our allegiance? The God of heaven and earth would like 
us to be part of his family. And he has made it known in stark terms through the ministry and life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ that he has only one intention that he has predestined us to, and that is life with him. The question to all of us is, are we still willing to accept that? Because in verse 4 of chapter 2, he says, because of his great love for us, he made us alive in Christ. This, this to me is, it, it brings up funny, funny thoughts like, well, if I'm not with Christ, what am I? And what Paul is basically inferring here in the beginning part of chapter 2 is, if you are not with Christ alive, part of those who are connected to the life giver, you are the walking dead. Yes, the walking dead. Those zombie movies, they're real. I mean, look at, look at the faces. I, I, I don't know if you've been to Vegas recently, but every single time I have walked the streets of Vegas, I see the living dead. Well, that's probably because they've been up for three days. Okay, and, and, and they've had one too many Red Bull, okay? But the fact is, if you're not connected, if, you're, if you've not made that decision to be part of the source of life that is holding this universe together, then, my friends, you are already experiencing separation. Separation from life. The second word that I want you to remember today comes in chapter 2, verses 5 and 8. It is by grace you have been saved. Through faith, through belief in the plan that is called Jesus Christ. When we believe in him, my friends... That is accorded to us, just as it was to Abraham and all the other patriarchs. It is accorded to us as righteousness. Our righteousness is as filthy rags, the Bible says. It is useless to save us. But God in his riches, God in his power, has offered Jesus Christ as an alternative way to come back to him. Sometime you, you should take a journey through the sanctuary and see that really the sanctuary service and the sanctuary tent, particularly the tabernacle tent, is a very, very specifically marked path back to God. We'll do that sometime. But it was provided to us by God's inimitable grace. His plan was to give us, to give us free salvation. The question is, do we value a free gift enough? Verse 9 reminds us that it's not of ourselves. Verse 10, we are God's workmanship. Thank you, Barry for showing us that again today. We are created, he has created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Barry and I were talking before uh, the Sabbath school and, 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 and this, this is what it is. We, we have computers today. We know that if you put a, a program into a computer, it is going to spit out certain activities, or at least it should. There's no glitches. So Paul is basically using his version of that language by saying that if, if, if we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, this is what it will mean. This is what it will look like if we're living in Christ. We will experience his grace and his power. And that experience spits out good works. Can't help it. We just won't be able to help it. 
he says in verse 11, you as a Gentile were unknowledgeable of this hope. So, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm not born Jewish, but understand that I've changed the word from Jew to, and, and Gentile to knowledgeable and unknowledgeable. The Jews knew because they had a history, they had a tradition, they had direct contact with God who had instructed them. So they had all of this that made them knowledgeable of God. The Gentiles that came from other groups that descended from Noah did not have this privilege. They were unknowledgeable. But here comes, here comes Paul and says, because of Christ, because of Christ, you as a Gentile were unknowledgeable of the hope that is the state of being that I call, that he calls, in Christ. Think hope, think Christ. You have been brought near. Oh, my friends, so much that I... I feel in this text. We have been far from God. And through Jesus Christ, like so many individuals in this congregation, definitely felt by the Thornbergs, I know. Those that have been far away have come in close for an embrace. This is the heart of God that Paul is talking about. God wants to bring us in close. He wants to embrace us. But there have been those who have been far away. Those who have been unknowledgeable. And as a result, they have not experienced the embrace of God. And so we're grateful. We're grateful as people who come from a tradition that is far from God that he has made a way for us to be close. And here comes word number three in verse 14. We've had hope, we've had grace, and here comes the next word. For he himself is our peace. Now many songs have been written about this. Many uh, uh, ideas, everybody has you know, the peace sign and all this kind of thing. But please understand what Paul says here is that the two become one. What is this business of two becoming one and this equals peace? Well, he's saying, look, the Gentiles and the Jews were part. Now they have become one. They are part of one nation under God, indivisible in Christ. How's that? Hope, grace, power, peace, togetherness. You know, we, we all understand that what we do in life takes us away from God often. So we feel a tug. We feel a tug when we think of Jesus because, you see, Jesus is that gluing agent. He would like... To, to, to weld us better than Gorilla Glue, he would like to weld us back together with God. And this, this welding back together, this is the idea of peace. That there's no longer any separation. But there's, there's, there's togetherness, not only, not only amongst ourselves, but between us and God. We're no longer separate. We're at peace. We are together. Verse 16, that we have been reconciled, peace, we have been reconciled to God through the cross. We've put to death our hostility towards God. This thing that separates us, this, this urge that we have in our lives to do it our own way, to go our own way, to do our own thing, which 
We celebrated on the 4th of July, did we not? We celebrated our independence from tyranny. Couldn't we just spiritualize that for a moment and say, why, why don't we celebrate our independence from the tyranny of the government of this entire planet by saying, Jesus is my leader. I am in Christ. I, I have determined this. And I'm not ever going to go back. By his grace, by his power, through the peace that he has provided of bringing me back into connection with God. My friends, in this chaotic world, there is so little hope that we can only come to the conclusion as, as I wrestle with this in my mind and I know that you wrestle with it. The only answer to the, to, to the need for hope in our lives today is the grace of God, is the, the, the gift and power of God to change the situation. I know I need that in my own life because I am powerless to change myself. So I, I, I don't even point one finger at anybody anymore. I, I just keep my hands behind my back. Because, because I cannot even change myself, let alone think that by whatever I do, I'm able to change someone else. I just, I just fall down on my knees and say, Jesus, this person needs you. This person needs you to change their hearts, to turn their hearts back. It's his job. The Holy Spirit's power, it's his job. I don't have to worry about that. Paul says that we are built on one foundation. Verse 20 of chapter 2, we're built on one foundation. All the apostles and all the prophets spoke about it. We are built on Jesus Christ himself. He is the chief, as, as Paul says, he is the chief cornerstone. He is the chief cornerstone upon what? In, in, in verse 22 the dwelling place of the Spirit of God is this building that God has, that Jesus has built called the church. It's called your, your heart and, and my heart. So three words today that the apostle gives us, hope, grace, and peace. We have hope in Jesus because of the grace of Jesus. And we therefore have peace with the Father. As the chaos continues, my friends, uh, to become worse, and I don't think it's going to get better, there are some who have a utopian view of the world and they think it's going to get better by our own strength and in our own way. And yes, we will make some things better, and I praise God for that. Uh, they will find cures that we haven't had. And for that we will be thankful. There will be peace in the world in various places where we haven't had it. So we look forward to the physical, the social, the political, and the spiritual world to be brought into the kingdom of heaven. It's the good news, my friends. God has come through Jesus Christ. And we sit here today proclaiming that we are looking forward to his next coming, at which time he will give evidence of the faith that we have now in the unseen. And he will say, this is the one that you have had faith in. And we will say, this is the God that we have had faith in. And we will hopefully, and I pray that you feel this way, we will have our families with us. Because we have had the faith to say, God, keep our families with us. We've had hope, we've had grace, we've had peace. Because God loves us, as the Bible says, as far as the east is from the West. Today, as we continue to celebrate, let us 
have our hearts fully concentrated on the one who is life and life eternal. Amen.